I mean, they really yeah. are treating you like a medical resident that yeah. works six out of seven days a week. So the yeah. really cool thing about that rotation um, in that month is I actually was with the resident team. Mm -hmm. So I was with PGY two and threes. Awesome. So it was really cool because yeah. like I, it was my second month mm -hmm. as a nurse practitioner in ICU. So I was so intimidated. I was... Have you ever wondered what it takes to get into an MP fellowship, how to land and secure that spot, how to perform well and what's what the nitty gritty day to day life is like? This is Daniel, and he's going to tell you all about his experience. He has a background as an ICU nurse, and he secured a very competitive critical care nurse practitioner fellowship. He's about three months into it. Yep. So he's going to tell you all the ins and outs about how to land it, what it's like, the ideal person for this type of role. And I think you're going to get a lot out of this video. If you're the person who's considering what you want to do post-graduation, this is a great video. I think you'll get a lot of inspiration from all that he has to share with you. Thanks for joining. If we haven't met yet, my name is Bree. I'm an RN, NP mentor, interview strategist, and content creator. Welcome to the channel. <laughs>tell the people a little bit about your background as a nurse. So I started out, um, I went to UNG for my undergrad. I got my BSN RN there. Um, and then I started out on a progressive care unit, an intermediate care unit, a step down unit, uh, mostly cardiopulmonary specialty, but it kind of did a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, I did that for about two years and then I transferred uh, and worked in their MICU there uh, for about two years. And that was kind of leading into the pandemic. Uh, and then from there, I worked there for about a year. And then finally, uh, jumped on the travel nurse COVID train, right. uh, travel contract, and then actually came up to where you are yeah. uh, and worked there for about nine months. And then I went to um, Mercer University in Atlanta to get my master's of yeah. uh, NP. So, yeah. And that's where actually I really met you because yeah. uh, during my... Um, I got my first semester, which was all like the, the courses and didactics. Uh, and then uh, when I came to actually needing clinical hours, uh, I was kind of thrown out uh, with the, because it was still, the, the pandemic was still happening. It and messed so, everything up yeah. for everybody. And so uh, I, I had a couple of um, clinicals lined up, but then those fell through because literally the response from these hospitals were RNPs and PAs are just burned out. Mm -hmm. So they just they said, we're just going to give them a break from having any students. You know, the pandemic was kind of coming to a slow end at that point. You were mm -hmm. very, very generous to take me <laughs> on. And it was my first time, you know, as an, uh, an NP student, my, like my first clinical hour. And my, it was a first rotation was the, the MICU with you. I know, which is yeah. sucks. Like, it really sucks to be a student in your very first rotation mm -hmm. going into ICU, mm -hmm. even if you have a ton of ICU background. It is 180 degrees different, as you saw. Uh, so, and I'm not necessarily an easy presenter. No. <laughs> I, I, We're laughing because we, yeah. <laughs> I kind of put him through the ringer. Yeah, and I remember that we, there's one day we had a, a, a one particular attending and you went, you're not gonna present today, I'll handle this. <laughs> uh, you just sit back, just kind of like go over there and yeah. kind of stay out of the way. Yeah. And, I, and then like when I saw this attending, grilling some of the residents and I was like, <sighs> but yeah. the rest of them were great. And, um, but yeah, it was a great experience. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, it was. And I mean, you, I watched you grow so, so much. And you can do that when you see someone from the very beginning, mm -hmm. because trying to shift your brain from the bedside, you walk in the room, you know, you got a patient that's got low blood pressure. They're on a bunch of drips. They're mm -hmm. on the vent to then walking in the room and going, okay, what is the medical diagnosis here mm -hmm. is a total shift in your mm -hmm. brain mm -hmm. and it's hard. Mm -hmm. So watching you start from this place of, I have no idea to then progressing to where you are at now, which we're going to get into in just a minute. Well, I want to talk just a little bit about Mercer. Mm -hmm. um, since I've had you as a student, Mercer has become one of my top recommended schools mm -hmm. for people who are in this area because I think they do require a fair amount of in-person attendance more mm -hmm. than some of the other strictly online. But um, just the training that I saw him receive and how in depth and how thorough it was really was impressive to me. And I know a lot of people that watch these this channel are really interested in what type of schools to go to. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I picked Mercer and I, I chose uh, to, to try to get in there and I applied and then got accepted um, was because they had a really, really good accelerated program. That was really important to me. Um, because I was working through the pandemic, I was really burned out. And so I did not want to do a part-time program where I had to work part-time mm -hmm. for two years and then also uh, go to school part-time and just drag it out for two years. Yeah. So that was a really big um, uh, perk for me, a big benefit, a big draw um, for me to go to Mercer. Um, I also had a personal uh, connection um, with one of the professors there. And he actually was a part, when I was a bedside nurse, 
um, in the ICU. He was a part of the like, kind of the residency onboarding training program for all the ICU nurses. And he's a, just he's one of those um, educators that uh, just not only is he an expert, but he just has a giftedness and a passion for teaching. And so I was like, if this is the guy that's teaching and guiding my program, I want to be there with yeah. him. And he, you know, he was phenomenal. And he really, um, from the classroom side of things, really, really helped me grow. And that, those are really big draws. Um, it's, it's got a great affordability aspect to it also. Um, they're, they're reasonably priced. They're fairly priced. Um, they also have a, a pretty good po program. Unfortunately, it was during the pandemic. So there were a couple of things mm. that were abnormal. Normally they had all the clinicals lined up for you, um, but just because they were like, hospitals are just telling us, no, we can't do anything about it. So we had to kind of find our own hours for that. But. So were you thinking you wanted to do critical care when you went back to school? That's why you chose the acute care? Yes, that's that was something I was very confident in. I, I always knew uh, I was going to work in critical care. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, that's what I've pretty much always done as a bedside nurse. Um, I do love the adrenaline. Mm -hmm. I do love the critical thinking. I love the demand of it. And then when you get these like heroic successes with certain patient stories, it's it's just that thing that just Yeah, keeps, it's quite a buzz. Yeah, I've always known that's where I wanted to be. And um, when I was doing clinical clinicals as a part of the acute care program. I did mostly ICU rotations, but um, I did a couple with some non-ICU rotations, either at the hospitalist or even in some clinics or outpatient mm -hmm. settings. And um, those, those rotations were great. It's just, I've realized that I need to be in an ICU. Yeah. And I also like the, um, the work-life balance where I just personally prefer having the 12 hour shifts yeah, same. because same. I, it's where I'm not working on Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. I, I like that flexibility. I like having multiple days off a week. Mm -hmm. um, I like just going in, doing my work, getting it done and yeah. then leaving. So yeah. That's, that's yeah. Well. You don't have any inbox you got to follow up no. with later. Mm -hmm. No charts you're going to carry over the next day. You're not so. calling patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why, that's why uh, I knew I wanted to work in the ICU. Um, and then also I think um, seeing that NPs and PAs who work in the ICUs, um, how all the PAs and MPs who've come before me, I've seen how hard of a journey it was for them, not only to learn and overcome the natural barriers it takes to become an ICU provider, but also there were just some cultural and I think some old institutional uh, forces that were a little bit resistant at first and to see them overcome and then to win their respect and to win um, just there, like no one rolled out a red carpet for them. Mm -hmm. And so when they, so to see these NPs and PAs in the ICU um, work so excellently that they w only won the respect uh, by their own hard work. That was something that really inspired me, um, and I wanted to be a part of that. Having said that, you decided not to apply for you know a permanent job, but instead a fellowship. So I'd love to hear about your fellowship experience. Yes. So there, I, I've had a I had a couple um, opportunities that they weren't like hard offers, but they were like, definitely like, yeah, would let us know when you graduate, when you're getting ready to take your license. And if there's a position, we'll definitely have that for you. So I didn't have like an official hard offer, but, um, I did find, and I didn't really know these existed and because they haven't really exist up until like I'd said the last six to seven years. Um, but specific for critical care fellowships and the one I'm in currently is the one through Emory and they take PAs and NPs um, and it is a postgraduate. So you graduate with your master's, you get your license. And then from there, once you start the program, it's one year from that date. And it's, um, it, it is, in my experience so far, one of the best things. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm so glad because, like, I mean, I'm about a little over three months into it now, and it's hard to know when you're, we haven't started it yet, what it's going to be like. Um, but the last three months have already been invaluable to me, and I foresee the next nine months to be increasingly, just increasingly valuable to me. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I chose the, I, I applied for the fellowship and wanted to do it, and then would, was very fortunate to be accepted and chosen for it. Um, was because it, it gives you a structured year long extra training um, for critical care, which I'm sure you know when you first started out in critical care, it's incredibly tough. It's going to be very unforgiving. They then the knowledge barrier or the knowledge gaps and the barriers that you have to overcome to become an independent, confident, competent provider is pretty daunting. Yeah. So having this um, one year long program where 
they don't take you lightly, but they do support you. So they, I like that because they challenge you really, really strongly, but they support you very, very well at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, not only are we, I mean, I've, I've been in three different ICUs, a MICU, a, a, a surgical ICU, um, and neuro ICUs. And right now I'm in the OR, uh, practicing intubations and getting my skills. Uh, and then I'll go to cardiac ICUs. And so over the next year, this is basically where we they have us just going to all these different ICUs. Uh, and then throughout all of that, they just have lecture days where um, you'll have the leading like liver expert mm -hmm. uh, of liver of a critical care transplant surgical ICU come and give you like a three hour lecture on everything you need to know about that. Like access to some of the highest experts um, in their field. That's personally, I just absolutely love that. Mm -hmm. um, they also um, have just a lot of simulations, lots of practice. Um, and because you are a learner, wherever we go, people are very eager. And like, if you show up willing and wanting to learn and asking for opportunities to get procedures, or um, if they're like, hey, why don't you take these patients? I'm like, yeah, I can take these and maybe I could take a couple more. They, they really respond well to someone who wants to learn and they're, they're really helpful in helping you get better. Mm -hmm. um, so I really, really like that. Um, and that's why I, I wanted to do the fellowship, and I'm really, really glad that yeah. I got chosen for it because it's it's really, really competitive to get it into. It is competitive. So how yeah. many stu how many did they take this year? Um, so there are six of us. Um, one is a cardiac specific um, ICU fellow. Mm -hmm. So and then the rest of us are doing the kind of everything gotcha. fellowship. So there's six of us. Um, we are a, a, a slightly larger cohort than they've taken in the past. Um, they usually do about three to four or five this group is six of us yeah yeah it's a pretty big um, group mm -hmm. i recall when i was at emory it was two yeah it was two and yeah. a lot of people applied but i don't know how many applied but i know mm -hmm. it was very very competitive yeah. um, between pas and nps everybody wanted to do mm -hmm. it so it's a 12-month program you rotate through a different specialty every month mm -hmm. do you get to are they electives do you get to choose them or do they pick them for you um so the the 11 months of it is um they pick it and then at the end they give you a month option to basically do whatever is available oh, which like is that. you can yeah. pick what you're interested in and what yeah. you like the most yeah. yeah and so some people will use that month to go maybe around with some sp hyper specific skill mm -hmm. or uh, maybe go to a certain icu mm -hmm. or maybe some of them might want to go like do like a month of just doing research or something mm -hmm. like that or um but a lot of people will We'll use that last month because um, when you're coming to the end of the year, um, they clearly want to retain you. They put mm -hmm. all this time and investment into you and, and they want to you know, see like where you want to work. And then they kind of look at what jobs are available and then you kind of pre-interview for these jobs. Mm -hmm. And if you're on the fence or maybe if the unit who's evaluating you is like, hey, well, why don't you come spend that month with us as like mm -hmm. a pre-employment kind of mm -hmm. see if you can fly. Right. And so you can go to that unit and work there for a month and then use that time to, you know, get to know the unit yeah. and see if the, 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 the chemistry and the culture yep. works and then to kind of prove yourself. Right. Um, which I think is really cool. And I'd, I'd hope to have the job that I want at the unit that I want, you know, and use that month where I would give to yeah. them and then be like, Hey, let's, let's use this to yeah. work it's, I mean, if you're a fellow, you mm -hmm. are almost guaranteed to get a job offer probably mm -hmm. in most of the units that you rounded on. It's a working interview mm -hmm. as much as it is a teaching thing, mm -hmm. but the benefit is they get to see you and you get a whole month to figure out if this is a dysfunctional team that mm -hmm. you want no part of, yeah. or if this is a great place and you're well supported. I mean, you are setting yourself up for the best odds for success when you have a fellowship. Training is dedicated towards you. It's supportive, as he said. There's a lot of additional resources provided to you. So you come out the door ready to go, fully trained. And if they've already had a chance to figure out if they like you and you all match, it's it's a win-win mm -hmm. on so many fronts, which is why these programs are so competitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Almost every single one of the fellows, um, the, the ones who've graduated in years past, um, all have had a job lined up and mm -hmm. almost all of them had just as much or maybe over what they were hoping to ask for. Um, and a lot of people will literally come from other parts of the country. So there's some from, I mean, Connecticut. Um, one of our fellows is from, or, um, Seattle, uh, from Seattle. Um, and then a couple are from like California and then they came here for this year. They moved here for this year. Um, and a lot of them ended up staying here in Atlanta and working at Emory, but some of them for personal reasons or just to be near um, family moved back home. And they said that like, whenever they were interviewing, they had 
uh, they, they interviewed six or seven different positions. Almost all of them gave them an offer mm-hmm. and they all were uh, actually competing and bidding for yep. wages to get yeah. them to come because they're like, we've heard about this program. Um, every MP and PA we've ever heard about or have personally worked with from this program are, are exceptional. So we want, we want you. Yep. <laughs> so, yep. um, I, I had, um, one of the cool parts about the fellowship that I forgot to mention is they actually do pair you with, um, mentors. So, um, the, the month or the cohort that started six months before us, we get paired with one of them oh, usually. That's cool. And so we just check in and we'll say, I mean, we're so busy. So usually it's just a text or a phone yeah. call, but sometimes people can meet up, get coffee or, uh, you know, get yeah. together for something that's like that. That's cool. Um, and then uh, one of them is usually one who's graduated. So, yeah. um, uh, like the one I am paired with, like he actually stayed here. He moved here. Um, he lives um, in the North Atlanta area and works, you know, at Emory still. Uh, but I text him all the time, like like if I'm stressed or I don't know something. Yeah. And he's very very helpful. And so they um and they they're really helpful in giving you insight. But they've all had job offers. And, I mean that's yeah. amazing because they just finished this. They mm-hmm. know the challenges specifically yeah. that you're going through. Mm-hmm. So what better mentorship can you get than that? Yeah. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They, so you have a lot going on in your life. You're married. I can't. You're not a newlywed anymore. It's no. been a minute, but you're married. You, ha- you have a spouse, mm-hmm. and you have that going on in your life. You're doing this job, and you have a business mm-hmm. in your a nursing business, which we're going to get to in another video. Mm-hmm. It's a whole topic, but mm-hmm. I want to know how you juggle all this. What is your schedule like, and how do you balance things? So, so that's one of uh, when you're when I was interviewing for the position, they you know make. They're very, very transparent about all of this, which is great. Um, and they're, they're basically telling you that this year is a um, huge time commitment, um, not only in physical hours, but I mean, uh, there's all, all the reading and the, the, the learning you have to do independently on top of the learning that they provide uh, via lectures and like learning days. But they also expect you to basically, on top of all that work, um, a basically full-time load on the actual units learning and working at the same time. Um, so it is quite a time commitment um, uh, that you really have to just um, weigh and, and value um, what you want to do. And for me, I did value this and this is what I wanted to do. And of course, I talked with my wife about it. We were on board together that this is going to be a tough year. Um, and then from there, it's just being, you know, having an honest conversation with all the other um, family and friends and other things in your life that you would normally, if you weren't completely busy with something very demanding like this, um, just to give them an honest conversation yeah. to say, Hey mom, dad, mm-hmm. you know, family, friends, like mm-hmm. I'm going to be very unavailable for this next year. Um, this yeah. is why. And, but the, the cool thing about it is, um, almost everyone that I've had that conversation with is unbelievably supportive. And they're mm-hmm. like, Hey man, that's great. Like go for it. Um, so just knowing that the time commitment will be um, a majority of your time and, and you're, you really are kind of lucky if you get a, a day or two. I know. Thank week. you so yeah. much for giving us your like one day off for the month. Yeah. Uh, we've been trying to schedule this interview for like probably a good six months. Yeah. I knew I wanted to do this a long mm-hmm. time ago, but I knew that his time was going to be very, very limited. Um, mm-hmm. So I do thank you so much for giving it to me today. Mm-hmm. So um, is it five, 12 hour shifts a week? I feel like when I looked back in the day, it was like 60 hour a week commitment. Yeah, it, it depends. So, um, so the month of July, I was on a surgical IC rotation. Um, and it was a great, great rotation. And what they, the way they had it, um, it was from six to about four every day, Mm -hmm. but I worked 27 of the 31 days that month. And some of those days were actually, were the lecture days, which were really nice because you just got to sit in the classroom and kind of learn, but my brain was a little fried. So I I just took notes and didn't retain any of it. So I have to go back and look at all that stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, talk about overload. (laughs) I mean, they really are treating you like a medical resident that works six out of seven days a week. So the yeah. really cool thing about that rotation um, in that month is that I actually was with the resident team. Mm-hmm. So I was with PGY two and threes. Awesome. So it was really cool because yeah. like I, I was my second month mm-hmm. as a nurse practitioner in ICU. So I was so intimidated. Sure. I was like, I mean, I was sweating. <laughs> And, um, yeah. but, but like they're so awesome because we're all learning. We're all kind of in that same mm-hmm. boat. Um, and they have done clearly so much more and, but they've done, um, part of the residency, they have to do, they have to learn everything mm-hmm. for me. All I've ever done is ICU. So mm-hmm. it was, it was really cool to be able to go in and like work alongside them yeah. during that month as well. Um, the, the, their rounds were grand academic, like full rounds and would mm-hmm. take like three to four hours Oh yeah. because you know, uh, the, they weren't just presenting the patient, coming up with the plan, moving on. Like, like the attendings would spend like 20 to 
45 minutes just lecturing yep. on something. Impromptu lecture yeah. on whatever they felt. Yeah, <laughs> getting pimped out on the shock states yep. and uh, everything. And then yep. they and then they, they throw in like some like complication, like what are you gonna do about shock yep. now? That you, yep. you know, it's so like you're like, oh yep. man. Uh, I'm a dummy, if, Why, yeah. I should not be doing this. <laughs> yeah. If you're gonna swing, you just swing hard. And if you strike out, strike out. So well. And then just kind of like shrug to the audience and go, well, I missed. So that's, <laughs> because then you'll learn. So like, you know, it, yep. you know but anyway, it's, it, it's that that rotation in particular is really good. Now, other rotations, when you're in an ICU rotation, um, it's pretty time consuming. Yeah. Like, so you're there all day. Um, you're there to learn. They expect, they're not just there, like when you're a nursing student or a nurse practitioner student, you're kind of shadowing. And if you get a good rotation with a good preceptor, they will kind of push you out there a little more. They expect you to show up. You're going to take patients. You're going to learn. You're going to look everything up. Do your full chart review. Go examine them. They're going to expect you to present. And then usually, like when you're brand new, they'll kind of talk through it and kind of help you get your plan together. But once you get to um, the first six months, were considered junior fellows, and then the second six months were considered senior fellows. Okay. Once you get to the second six months, that's when you're in the cardiac ICU. Yeah, you're running it. We go to Grady for two months, um, and then we do like a MICU. It's pretty high acuity. Uh, NICU. And so they are expecting you to take all a full load of patients to do everything and to do a plan. Mm -hmm. um, and then the attendings are really cool because they, if they clearly see that you have a knowledge gap, they'll just quickly, you know, help you with that. Or they'll say, Hey, here's what you need to learn and then come back and, you know, present on it later or tomorrow or whenever. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the time commitment is, is, is a lot, but, but that's why we wanted this position. And then, and, and I think that, um, I was talking with actually one of my uh, mentors about this and he says that, yeah, it's one year, but when you're done with that year, it's like you worked two to two and a half years. Oh, it really, it's totally a fast yeah, track. Yeah. It's because, a fast track. Like you are fully immersed. You got to commit to it. You're mm -hmm. taking a little bit of a pay cut from what you'll get once you get mm -hmm. out into true practice, mm -hmm. but it's so worth it. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's worth it. You got to mm -hmm. find what's right for you and your life and your family. Mm -hmm. But if you have the opportunity, oh my gosh. Yeah. And that, that's experience. a really good point. Also the, um, the, there is a bit of a financial opportunity cost to this also, because if you just go straight out working in an ICU as an MP or a PA, you will make more money doing that. So if you are in a position where you're not going to be financially strapped, um, that's something to consider also, like you, you will be, um, working a lot more, um, doing a lot more and you won't, the pay will not oh, it won't, won't, be good. won't be there. <laughs> but as you pointed yeah. out earlier, you're, it's a short term loss for mm -hmm. a long term gain yeah. because then you get five job offers. Yep. You have leverage cause they want you. Mm -hmm. You can command more salary mm -hmm. at that point and you have your pick of jobs. So mm -hmm. it, if you're able to swing it, it yeah. is a great payoff yeah. in the end. Hey friends, are you a brand new NP or perhaps you're in school doing an IC rotation? Are you drowning in the vat of information overload and struggling to make sense of it all? I got news for you, we have all been there, my friend. Your rate of growth is directly tied to how much time you spend on education along with exposure to a broad range of problems that we commonly see. I developed this program called the Acute Care Lab Membership to help flatten out the learning curve for novice critical care providers. It is ideal for a hospital-based APP who stabilizes or manages decompensating patients like hospitalists, ICU providers, acute care students who are in school, even ICU nurses, especially those who work in critical access hospital with minimal provider oversight, or those that really just want to raise the bar and go deeper into understanding the pathophysiology and management of critical patients. This is a program designed with two monthly lectures on concepts like vents, drips, interpreting ABGs, how to prevent peri-intubation cardiac arrest, and so forth. My educational approach is heavily based on the foundation of understanding the why over the how. So it always begins with a review of the pathophysiology, followed by assessment tips, development of differentials, and establishment of a plan of care, teaching you action-oriented, evidence-based care. These lectures are presented live because I really believe that interaction with live Q&A is the most beneficial for your learning. However, I understand that most people are not able to do that at all times. So membership here will give you unlimited access to all of the recorded lectures that you can view on demand whenever it's convenient for you. You'll have access to a plethora of written documents to help you as well. Keynote slides, PDF documents I've created, templates. The membership is full of additional resources and comes with all of the perks that you see here. If you have interest in this, please go check out the website, brienp.com and find out if this is right for you. Thanks for watching all my videos and all the support, friends.
in your opinion, what type of nurse practitioner or new grad NP is ideal for a fellowship or residency program? Um, well, for, for the critical care program, there, there are some non-critical care fellowships, and I, I would say this is a pretty good um, kind of principle for all fellowships or all postgraduate training programs is that you really, really, really need to lead and sell with that you want this, you want to be here, and they need to know why you want this. Um, like when I went into my interviews and because they asked that question, they're like, why this program? Why you? And I was mm -hmm. like, I'm critical care. That's all I want. I want this because I want to be the best critical care provider that I can be, especially coming out as a new provider. And I believe that this program will get me there. And mm -hmm. so, and so if you come at it from like a, I'm going to get something from you, but I also want to give you something. Um, that's a much better collaborative relationship. And I think they'll be much more um, receptive to that. Um, I think you, you need to know with a hundred percent certainty, this is what you want, because when you're in it, it's very stressful. It's it, we've already talked about the time commitments, the, the, the opportunity cost with, um, finances. Um, but sometimes it's just really stressful. And mm -hmm. so you need to know why are you here and why you're going to keep showing up and because they absolutely do not want you to quit. Uh, and they will not, you know, if they even get a, a whiff that you might quit under stress or crack under pressure, they may, you know, sense that and maybe try to look for someone else who's like determined to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the ideal candidate is someone who really, really wants it. Um, and I think um, interviewing strongly is is big, but I also think that having a strong resume um, is important because when I applied on my resume, I put, because all I really had when you're a new grad is you don't have any experience. So it's like, please hire me. Mm -hmm. um, so other than interviewing well and, and selling yourself and selling your intentions, I think uh, one thing that's really important is putting your clinicals that you had um, in your program uh, as an NP student. And for me, mm -hmm. I, well, a big selling point was 80 to 85 percent of my clinical hours were spent in an ICU. They were moderate to like pretty good acuity ICUs and um, being able to get good, strong references from really good providers. Also, I had multiple, all of my preceptors in NP school um, gave me strong recommendations. Um, and all of, uh, some of the, even the attendings and the doctors that I worked with there also gave me some, it did help that some of these attendings also did go to Emory and when they were a resident and their fellowships that were at Emory, they had strong connections and they really advocated for me because I, as we talked about earlier, I went into those rotations saying, hey, um, this is why I'm here. I'm here to learn, but I'm also looking to be considered for a job. And um, when I found out about the fellowship later into my program and I asked them about it, they all went, you should do that. And we want to help you get there. And so I think mm -hmm. that's really, really important to have um, is having those people behind you. And then you have to like know well before you even are going to be considering the fellowship that you need to go in, you want to be there and to lead strongly with that. Because yeah. cause when, when you're when you're competing with hundreds of MPs and PAs who all just graduated, um, there there's some people who are just going to have a better pedigree than you. They're going to have a better resume. They're going to have a better program or, or however, all the hospitals and, and the hiring managers and all these people, all the, the factors and forces that, that influence their decision to pick you it's hard to compete because we all are basically like, I don't have any experience. Right. Please hire me. Right. And they're like, well, what do you have to show for yourself? And if you just go with like, well, I kind of want this. I kind of had some clinicals. I have a couple of references. They're going to be like, yeah, there's going to be someone else who really wants it. And they're going to have that. Uh, and they're going to, they're going to compete. And yeah. Take that spot. I think really and truly these things, it's much like interviewing for a job. Mm -hmm. You've got to show that you have the, a strong enough foundation, like mm -hmm. the technical skills to start out with, and that you have the transferable skills. Mm -hmm. You have the innate ability to really buckle down to multitask, to dive really, really deep into education mm -hmm. and focus. And you have a strategy in place prepared to help you cope with all these roles you're about to tackle. Mm -hmm. They want to know that you're the kind of person who's passionate about it, mm -hmm. who has the experience, and that who has the wherewithal to continue through and then come out as a strong provider. Mm -hmm. Someone who needs a lot of education but has so, so much promise. That's what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And if you can show them that, which a lot of people have a hard time doing, a lot of people have a hard time illustrating and communicating their skill sets in a formal manner. Um, but spend some time researching how to do that. You, you will have a much better odds of getting that spot mm -hmm. for sure. Um,
I just can't tell you how proud I am of you. I have seen you grow so, so much. and I haven't even seen you practicing. I can imagine that at this point, you have things you should teach me. Uh, so, and, uh, I'm only three months in. So I know. Oh, but you, yeah. you, Emory is top tier yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. But any kind of fellowship is just going to set you up for so much mm -hmm. success. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. And also, I want to say something about Brianna. Um, you've inspired me. Aww. You not only when I was your uh, student, uh, but also seeing how you practice the bedside. Um, you're a kick-ass mom. Aww. You are just a great person. Aww. And so I think, um, so, and also when I, I think when I was listening to you, I think we were sitting in, um, I think at one of the offices when I was at clinical with you and you were talking about your business and I went, oh, hey, um, I actually have an idea for yeah. my business too. Like it just, because I knew how hard it was and then seeing um, you have the same pursuit, um, I instantly respected you more. I, you, you inspired me. And so I, I just, um, if, if y'all are following her, keep following her. She's going to learn a lot. And if you want to be an MP, she'll, she'll, she'll whip you into shape just like she did me. <laughs> so. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I feel like good education is one that doesn't just let people shadow. It's so much, let them have an opportunity to shine. Mm -hmm. And when they don't shine, you're like, uh, that stinks. Let's start over yeah. because this is the real world and and tough love, right? You, you got to have some tough love. Yeah, and also I think um, I I did because I I knew I saw how good you are and I saw like all the things I previously said about you um, that I did trust you that if you were critiquing me, it's because you genuinely meant well and I felt that from you Aww. that you actually wanted me to Aww. be better. Aww. So um, so if you are a learner and of course like. I'm a learner for the next year, and everyone who works as an NP in NICU is a learner for all Lifelong. always. Lifelong. So just, I think if you can detach your ego, if you can detach um, the kind of that sense of protective self from any sort of criticism or, um, you know, or even if it's just like, hey, this could be better, um, you're gonna you're gonna learn more, and people will respect you more. And also, if you, if if someone who's trying to like critique you and make you better sees that you receive criticism well, I think that also d makes it develops Absolutely. a stronger relationship. Mm -hmm. And then there, like I have actually had more learning on the other side of someone first giving me a criticism and then I just receive it really well. I go, yeah. oh, thank you for that. And like, they're mm -hmm. like, wow, this person is not completely in disheveled from the well, fact that I- you have emotional intelligence, right? Yeah. It is hard to get negative feedback. And yeah. as a student, particularly, yes. that's all you hear all day long. Mm -hmm. So it's <laughs> real easy to put in this like, I suck, why did I even decide to do yeah. this? You gotta be real, you gotta have a good, strong sense of self and realize they're telling you this because they care about you yeah. and they want you to be better for the mm. most part. Do you remember the first time um, when I was, uh, the first time you made me present during rounds and I froze? Maybe, yeah. Okay, no, so I, the first time I was with her and she was like, all right, well, you've shouted for like a, a day, so now it's time <laughs> to get out there and present this patient. And I was like, this is a so something so-and-so-year-old patient. And, and I just went and completely froze. And I looked over at you and you just went, so anyway, so it's like she just took over the whole thing. And, and, and like, I mean, everyone kind of was like, oh, boy, I don't know if this guy's going to fly. And then I, I, I pulled you aside afterwards, and I was like, you and I are going to sit down for like as long as it takes, and you were going to go over presenting. Yeah. And then we, we did that. Mm -hmm. We went back into the office, and we were trying to present that patient. And like it took me like seven attempts mm -hmm. to get it right. And you were like, stop thinking like a nurse. Yeah. You need to think like a provider. Do this, this, and this. And, and I remember that. And it was to, to look like a complete idiot in front of a lot of very, it's very smart people. It's yeah, it's humiliating. It takes, you have to, you if you can't learn how to overcome that and have, if you can't like really grasp a good strong sense of humility, I don't think you're really gonna go far. It, yeah, like, it's, you, you gotta be, yeah. you gotta be willing to go into the muck and mm. beat yourself up for a while, but realize that rock bottom is the place you go, you grow from. Yeah, and you bounce from rock bottom. Mm. It's been great, it's been great working from you, learning from you and doing this with you, Brianna. And so oh, thanks for fun. having me and oh. it's been a pleasure being here. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. I can't wait to see where you end up. Um, we are, stay tuned, the upcoming in probably a couple of weeks, there will be a video where Daniel's gonna tell us all about his nursing entrepreneurship journey, because mm. he also has a business. Yes. <laughs> this is a busy man, my friends. <laughs> Very busy. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Sorry, pot. What was the, what was the question? What was the, <laughs> what was the uh... I, I hate sim labs. I, when I get in a sim lab, I start getting all in my head. I'm like, wait, is that mannequin supposed to be blinking? Yeah, or no. is that not a blink? You're like, am I supposed to be able to not pass this? They, um, 
ah god, i had a question. i totally just lost it.